When I was a child, one of my favorite activities that my parents would take us to do was to go to this duck pond, which was in the high desert, kind of this oasis in the middle of the desert where all these ducks would gather and you could feed them, you could walk around, there were a couple outdoor activities. And I loved going there. I think my parents loved going there because we would fall asleep on a long car ride and it only cost a loaf of bread to feed the ducks. It's a great uh, activity for a young family that's cost effective. Um, but what's interesting about going to that pond is no matter who I saw, young or old, everyone avoided the geese. The geese were like, oh, stay away from them. They're these like very volatile, intimidating creatures. And let me ask you, what is more intimidating or worthy of fear? A goose or a peaceful dove? You know, we have this image of the Holy Spirit. We always see him characterized as a dove. And yes, the Holy Spirit does bring peace. But ancient Celtic Christians had this description of God's Holy Spirit as Agiad Glas in Gaelic, which means the wild goose. And I love that. They, they saw how consistently scripture paints the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, as completely untamable. A dynamic person represented by a dove, but also by a blazing fire and shredding wind and glorious and joyful, but uncontrollable. That was who the Holy Spirit was to them. And I think a goose is a great image for the Holy Spirit. I mean, if you think about when geese fly in formation, they create their own unique form of community. And the Holy Spirit brings us in community together. The Holy Spirit overflows. In a goose formation, as every bird flaps their wings, it creates lift for every bird following behind them. So everything they do also amplifies. Because of that formation and because of that lift, they can travel together 71% further than they could if they flew on their own. And the Holy Spirit does that. It amplifies and overflows our actions for one another and as a church. The Holy Spirit also warns, protects, and guards us. Just like geese who are flying in formation will honk to alert those ahead in formation to keep up their speed, to encourage them, or to let them know of impending danger. The Holy Spirit unites us and brings us together. When a goose falls out of formation, uh, it suddenly feels this drag and resistance of trying to go it alone, and it quickly gets back in formation to take advantage of that lifting power of the birds in front of them. It propels them to unity. The Holy Spirit also sustains us. When uh, the lead goose in a formation gets tired, it rotates back into the V and another goose takes the lead. The Holy Spirit will call us to those positions of leadership, will call out our gifts at the right time to use them for the glory of God and for the church. And lastly, the Holy Spirit is a comforter. When a goose in formation gets sick or if it's wounded and falls out of formation, two other geese will also fall out of formation, let it down or follow it down to the ground and help it protect it. And they will stay with it until it comes back to health or until it dies. And then they will fly together on their own to catch up to another formation. The Holy Spirit does all of those things for our formation of the church. The Holy Spirit is the power of God, inspiring, comforting, uniting, and sustaining us to become the individuals we were created to be, all contributing to build the church God created. All of our desires, our longing, everything they point to, everything we've been talking about in these episodes and this relationship with God is all inspired, sustained by the person of the Holy Spirit. It says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus promises this to the disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now that word that's used for power is the Greek word dynamos, where we get the word dynamite. And dynamite sure is powerful. You know, in fact, asking the Holy Spirit to come into your life is kind of like trying to take a drink from a waterfall. Like it's too much power. It can be overwhelming but overwhelming in the best way possible when it comes to the spirit. That word dynamos for power in Greek is also where we get the word dynamic. 
You know, dynamic means something that's characterized by constant change, activity, or progress. And so with the Spirit, our lives will never be boring. They'll never be static or bland. I mean, read the stories of the saints. Every one of them, you can see the activity of the Spirit in their lives and how it led them on great adventures, both inwardly in their prayer and their relationships and outwardly for some of them who went on amazing missionary journeys or became incredible evangelists and performed miracles. The Holy Spirit is dynamic, transforming our bodies into temples of God and our souls into dwelling places for Jesus. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? And what's incredible is we see this happen in the early church in the apostles at Pentecost. Now, Pentecost happened 50 days after the resurrection, 10 days after Jesus ascends into heaven. He tells them, wait, I will send you this power, as we just read. And so they're gathered together, these apostles, these people who, they were not the best and the brightest. You know, they were off doing their own trades. They weren't still studying in synagogues. They weren't disciples to other rabbis. They display numerous imperfections and human vices, like denying Jesus, doubting his resurrection, being impulsive, proud, afraid. They were hiding in those days following the resurrection out of fear of death and persecution from the Romans that the same thing would happen to them. But it says in Acts chapter 2, when the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all alone in one place together, and suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues as of fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and able to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. Now, what's important about this is the Spirit brings supernatural gifts and a supernatural sense of unity where there was formerly division and doubt and insecurity. We see this as the undoing of another story from Genesis chapter 11. This is a story that a lot of people don't know or hear very often. It's the story of the Tower of Babel. You've probably heard the story of Noah's Ark. Noah's descendants, his sons, they eventually become numerous and they want to build a tower to get to heaven to show God how great they are. And this is an action they do out of their own selfishness, their own pride, because they want to make a name for themselves. The Holy Spirit doesn't do this. The Holy Spirit brings unity for all people, not inflates pride or selfishness. And so wherever there's true unity, that is where the Holy Spirit is. But God sees what they're doing in the Tower of Babel and he comes down and he allows their language to be, to be divided and scatters them across the entire earth. But for us to be Catholic, the word Catholic literally means universal. That's what the literal word Catholicos means, where we get the name Catholic from. That means that you will find Catholicism in every culture, in every area of the planet, in missions and churches, and by all different creeds, cultures, genders, uh, backgrounds, races, all these people coming together to become Catholic, to be part of the body of Christ. This is a church for everyone. We are one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Not many, but one. And the Holy Spirit is who brings that unity and brings out the gifts in each one of us to make that unity even more profound and amplified for eventually, hopefully, everyone in the world to come into the fold. So after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit enables these apostles uh, to look death basically right in the face. They preach the truth of Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Peter, who had denied Jesus and was at his lowest point probably, went out after receiving the Holy Spirit on Pentecost and he preached the gospel to a crowd and 3,000 people were baptized that day. They went from 12 to 3,000 after one speech. That's 250 times bigger than it was because of the gifts that the Holy Spirit had given St. Peter. That Holy Spirit, we also understand, is the embodiment of the love between the Father and the Son. So if you think about any relationship, there's always three things. There's always the lover, the beloved, and the love in between them. And that love multiplies. And so the God the Father is the lover, God the Son is the beloved, and because that love between them is so strong, it becomes this new person of the Holy Spirit. All three persons have always existed for all eternity. The God of the universe, our one supreme God, has always been one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. But that has been revealed to us slowly over time. 
that love multiplies and that is who the Holy Spirit is. You think about a marriage, the husband is the lover, the wife is the beloved. And between them, when that love is shared, nine months later, it is named and becomes a new person, the love in between them. So think about that as the fruitfulness of the love of the church, of the love of God for us and for his son, Jesus. In fact, it says in the Catechism, paragraph 733, God is love and love is his first gift containing all others. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That same love conceived Jesus in the womb of Mary, who is called the spouse of the Holy Spirit. And St. Gregory Nazianzus once said that the, the Old Testament proclaimed the Father clearly, but the Son more obscurely, prophesied Jesus. The New Testament revealed the Son and gave a glimpse of the divinity of the Spirit. But now the Spirit dwells among us and grants us a clearer vision of himself. The Holy Spirit is the way in which we've been sent to experience God, the way in which God continues to be in relationship with us in this time. So what do we know about the Holy Spirit? What have we learned about him? Well, the Holy Spirit is God, third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is symbolized in many ways as, you know, a dove, a goose, uh, fire, wind, water. But the Holy Spirit ultimately is a person, just like God the Father or God the Son. The Holy Spirit um, in, in Hebrew is the word ruah. In Greek, it's pneuma. In Latin, it is spiritus. All of those mean breath. And if you remember our um, episode on relationship, I believe, we talk about how the name Yahweh, yod, he, vav, he, is all breathy sounds and syllables. So every time we breathe, not only are we saying the name of God, we are inhaling and exhaling the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, we've learned, guides the Catholic Church. So it persists without error. Uh, the Holy Spirit inspired sacred scripture to be without error. And it comes to each one of us in the sacraments, particularly the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. So when you and I were baptized, or if you're not baptized yet, when you eventually get baptized, we receive the Holy Spirit for the first time, uh, sacramentally. And when we are confirmed, the full force of the Holy Spirit is unleashed in our lives. Not only that, we're strengthened in the unique gifts and talents, the charisms, that we've been given to fulfill our unique mission in life. To experience the fullness of our own desires for love, belonging, truth, goodness, and beauty, and to promote and defend and live the Catholic faith out in our everyday lives, wherever the Lord calls us. So we receive what's called the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And there are seven of these. They are wisdom, understanding, counsel or right judgment, fortitude or courage, knowledge, piety or reverence, and fear of the Lord, which is often sometimes also called wonder and awe in God's presence. So not that we should be afraid of God, but we should understand like, wow, God is vastly big. And it's kind of scary how big he is and how powerful he is, but in a, in a good way, a secure way. And when we use those gifts and when we live them out, we're called to bring forth the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And there are 12 of these. These come from Galatians chapter five, the um, gifts of the Holy Spirit coming from Isaiah chapter 11. And the 12 fruits of the Holy Spirit are love or charity, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, generosity, gentleness, faithfulness, modesty, self-control, and chastity. Now you look at those two lists and those are things we all desire and want, right? Those are all good things. The Holy Spirit continues to give us knowledge of God living and active in the church and inspires us to these good things. The Catechism, lastly, uh, tells us eight ways that the Holy Spirit makes God present to us. This is in paragraph 688. One is Scripture, because the Holy Spirit inspired Scripture to be without error. One is through the saints, because they all lived as Spirit-led lives. One is through the teachings of the Church, because we know that the Church's teachings are without error because of the magisterium. One is through the sacraments, because that is how we receive the Holy Spirit in a unique way. One is through prayer, because the Holy Spirit is the one who inspires us first to even be able to pray in the first place. One is through missionary work, uh, participating in those different efforts and how we serve others. Another is the charisms, those gifts, ministries that we're involved in, ways that we can contribute to the church to provide for the needs and welfare of others. And finally, through history, we see through the tradition of the church how the Holy Spirit has led the church without error generation after generation. The Holy Spirit is our guide, our comforter, our inspiration in daily Catholic life. That life is one that is part of a wider community life. And so 
when we have the Holy Spirit, you're not alone. You're flying in a flying formation spirit of spirit-led geese traveling toward heaven. And so the question is, who is flying in formation with you? Who can you invite maybe on this journey with you? We're about 10 episodes, 11 episodes in now. And if you think that this is valuable, which at this point, I hope you do because you're still watching, um, who might you invite to join you on this journey? Maybe you need someone to lead you, uh, a regular confessor, a spiritual director, a mentor, uh, a more intentional spiritual relationship with a parent, godparent, or sponsor. How can you invite that formation to come around you? How can you invite those people to lead you and journey with you as you dive deeper into the big questions that your heart is asking? The Holy Spirit loves and flows in and through these relationships, brings us together. So you are not alone. I know this is a time where we are very isolated and we feel a lot of fear, worry, separation, and division. But if you ever feel those things, simply just open your hands, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and say the words, Come Holy Spirit. And soon enough, you will be flying back in formation again.